Tangent colon. Tangent colon. Tangent colon. Tangent colon. Tangent Calling, the podcast where we go off on weekly tangents based on the books we publish, covering everything from music to street art to local ghosts, witches, vampires, pubs, pirates, to literature to foraging for mildly, only mildly, psychedelic tea, to interviews with astoundingly creative people who can do most of the stuff that I've just mentioned. My name is Sol, and today me and Richard will be chatting to Stanley Donwood, the renowned artist, author, radiohead, artwork genius, uh, as well as Matt Consume, uh, an incredibly talented filmmaker from Bristol. And these two have recently created this film called Broad Me the Movie. As always, on the Tangent Books website, we're going to give you a discount code for 10% off a select number of books. And this week is going to be all of Stanley Donwood's fiction and prints that are on the website, as well as vinyl copies of the Broadmead the Movie soundtrack, which is astonishing. So make sure to go check that out. Please like and subscribe. And I'll just quickly fill you in on a couple of things that come up in the podcast. So the first one is that we mentioned that we'd like to show Broad Me the movie at the end of this video. Unfortunately, we can't do that, but we are hoping to do a special tangent showing of the full film some point soon. Um, if it does all go ahead, then hopefully it will be in December, maybe January. So that is going to be really exciting and keep your eyes peeled for that because it's going to be great. And the second thing I just want to mention is that the first five minutes or so of this uh, interview didn't get recorded, unfortunately. Um, so I'll just quickly fill you in on what happened there so that it makes sense when you come into it. Matt and Stanley were talking about how they met, uh, how they first met in Plymouth. And they were talking about uh, the raves that they used to go to or that Matt would put on. Uh, and at these raves, they had these devices called brain machines, which were, um, don't try this at home. They were uh, like helmets of some sort and you would you would put it on and it had all these LED lights in it. <laughs> and so it would flash LEDs <laughs> into your eyes. Um, so, yeah, I mean... <laughs> Uh, don't try it at home. But yeah, they, they were chatting about that and uh, that's kind of where we, we come in, them talking about the rave, the raver days. So hope you enjoy. Uh, see you later. Last rate that was supposed to put you into a trance-like state. And everyone was on drugs, really, so it was asking for trouble, to be fair. <laughs> I was waiting for you to say that rather than me. Uh, there was a fair amount of psychedelics involved. There, there was, you know, yeah. you know, it was it was unpoliced at that point. Mm. No, well, well, you know, they, they were being tested, but they were being tested by our mates, really. So, <laughs> you know, it wasn't it wasn't a um, scientific grade. It was just these are fucking brilliant, you know. What were what were the drugs of choice back then for the, during the rave culture? Was it was this uh, MDMA or was it a bit of was it a bit of everything? It was, it was primarily. LSD and and oh speech. really yeah uh, there were there were the, there was twenty quid they were they, one they were um, sort of fairly they weren't weren't as ubiquitous as they once became and they were also really expensive so yeah lot, twenty you know, quid was a lot because when you're only getting like less than forty quid a week for the yeah. on dole mm. like twenty quid pff. it's a lot and. Um, then we we painted a mural together at a school, which um, yeah. that, that was my first time in a newspaper. That was, was it? The first, first piece of press I ever had, mate, I think probably. Really? Was that mm. with you when we... Um, Might have been mine. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. Yeah, we're up scaffolding. And That's right. we've got the kids. The kids painted their own... They drew their own pictures. And we, we copied their pictures yeah. big onto the big chimney. Yeah, it. It I really can remember high. the picture. I don't have a copy of the picture anymore, but you were in a very fetching um, Mandelbrot 
T-shirt. Oh, I have hair and then. A big oh. flash of uh, spiky orange hair. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's hair. Back in the but day. My, my hair fell out shortly after that. I don't think it was anything to do with it. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, mate. No, no. Well, yeah, it was when I was about 23, my hair fell out. Yes. So, yeah. Did it go back a long way then? And um, God, yeah, uh, that, it's really hard to remember. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so was this the, was this pre um, pre Radiohead, presumably? In the yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think I did. I probably. When, I think I started doing that in nineteen ninety four. Yeah, I think you did. You work on a on a Radiohead single as well, I Matt. Did, a... I did a single with with that because he was at the one that was being paid at the time, and I think. I got a go, Pete got a go, uh, Kim, sadly, no longer with us. Did she do one with you? Don't, we did a show. Uh, it's... Yeah, I know Pete, I know Pete did one with you, I did one with you, I don't know who else, but I remember at the time you were like, I've got a budget to do things. And yeah, right, because we did, I did love and all that. Borrowed, borrowed video cameras to, to get, Screen grabs and stuff like that, yeah. That's it. It's very vague. Yeah. So, it's, um, of course, you, you will get, we'll get on to what your latest collaboration is um, a bit later. But, um, but uh, Stanley, what are, you, what are you working on at the moment? Don't know. Um, <laughs> Are uh, Radiohead keeping you busy or have you got some, uh, some time to yourself now? Or? No, well, that, yeah, there's, no, there's no shows anymore. Yeah. There's no gigs, there's no tours, there's nothing. So uh, I'm sort of doing something. I can't remember what it is. Uh, you should talk to Matt for a minute. So coy. Come on, I know he's yeah, upset. I can't remember. Really. Well, I'll do some shameless uh, self promotion then. Yeah, uh, new, uh, new single coming out on uh, Cyberspeak Records in Milan uh, on the 13th, Friday the 13th of November. Oh, good date. Good date. Well, it was supposed to come out on the 3rd, but the video that I did was um, apparently was <laughs> YouTube said no because it had some anti Trumpian statements in it. Surprisingly, and uh, said I, no. which was the you only thing, to say no the to one thing they asked me. <laughs> the one oh, thing really? they asked me to do was put an anti uh, anti Boris message in it. So um, that got shelved, and then obviously, as it sort of transpired, even though Mr. Trump is yet to concede, um, it was sort of out of date before it happened, which is me all over, really. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's a uh, new signal. Chaos is the new cocaine. Oh, you went out and did that a little while ago, didn't you? In, that's uh, it, yeah. So in that, Milan. That yeah, you're finally, telling me about it. That finally comes out and um, working on new uh, Negative Negative, which is the other band stuff. But Dan's right, when it ever, there'll ever be shows again, who knows? Yeah. Um, but I'm, yeah. sure he's, I'm sure he's just being coy and he's up to something. Well, I'm, I'm at the moment, I'm supposed to be in, a, I'm supposed to be in Porto, in Portugal, because um, they said, they gave me this, like, a, it was a little palace called a palacette. <laughs> it was just outside the city, city of Porto in this, in this sort of grounds with stables and it was massive. And I could do whatever, it was sort of derelict. And I could do whatever I wanted in it. And there was a budget of 100,000 euros. Um, oh, and I got a crew together from, from the Shangri-La lot at Glastonbury and figured out what we we're going to do. And that was going to be happening now. But wow. obviously, and then I was, there was a big conference as well. I was, I was going to talk in front of uh, 1,200 people with the microphone. 1,200 really? people. Wow, yeah, yeah, so, that's not really your I know. Okay, so, so I was quite nervous about it. Well, I understand. And when, when uh, coronavirus happened, I was, I was just like, brilliant. I don't <laughs> do it. Yeah. But yeah, that's what I would have been doing if it hadn't been for coronavirus. I'd have been in Portugal right now, enjoying ah, the sun, you know, drinking whatever yeah. they drink there. Fino Verde. Fino Verde, yeah, yeah. It's a uh, Dow, yeah. Nice. 
So, I hate um, to be vulgar, mate, but do you often get offered a hundred thousand euro budgets to do things these first days? First time. First time. First time. <laughs> I know. Right. Not only not only that, I was also asked to go to the Edinburgh Literary Festival and talk there, and right. to go to the one in Bath, the Bath Literary Festival, and talk to Max Porter. All of these things, all cancelled, all oh, gone. Shame. I know. Shame. I know. I'm sort of on a, a literary tip, which I know you. Uh, you enjoy and um, yeah, I and sort of like you know. In, yeah. yeah. So well, talk, talking about books, then let's um let's talk a little bit about uh, about your books. Um, you you, t you years ago, I think at Garrick's Head, we were having a uh, enjoying a glass of uh, of cider after a hard day's work. Um, or before one even. Or before during, 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 one. During, or during, yeah. 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 Yeah, Gideon may well have been there actually, in which case it was definitely during. Definitely during, yeah. But you said that you, were, you were, at one point you regarded yourself as much as to be an author as um, as an artist, and uh, that's, that's the side of talking. It was, yeah. But it's, but, but yeah. you're a very accomplished author. Do, 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 the writing side, obviously, you didn't do so much of, but you're doing you're yeah. doing a lot more again now, aren't you? Well, sort of. Um, I keep trying. I think I like the idea of it. Um, and and I was sort of, uh, I had such a gentle introduction into the world of publishing, because first of all, I had Mr. Blimfield, who introduced me to the whole sort of cider drinking while working ethos. And then, then there was you and Steve, which really carried on with the whole cider drinking while working ethos. But then... Um, then the book, one of our books got picked up by Faber, and, uh, well... To be fair, was, I remember meeting with you at Faber, and there was a fair amount of cider drinking that went on there. Well, well it wasn't, <laughs> see, it was wine. It was wine by that point. <laughs> yeah, and it's a lot more dangerous. And then, uh, and then, um, well, yeah, I've had dealings with Thames and Hudson as well, and uh, Penguin. So, yeah, uh, basically, apart from the first publishers that I knew, I kind of think of publishers, it's, it's like, so, so if, if you're an author, you're, you're up to air, you're, you're floating in the Pacific, you've just, you've just been in some sort of crash, and circling around, there's all these fins, that's all the publishers, <laughs> that's how it is, they're ruthless predators. Oh, I've never thought of myself as a ruthless predator. Well, exactly. I'm not including you in this. Oh, that's very kind of you. You're one of the dolphins. <laughs> oh. Spider the drinking dolphin. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I don't know what Blenfield is. <laughs> I've not. Have you he's seen like him? an eel. He's missing in action. He, he is missing in action. I think he's <laughs> perambulating whales in a milk float. I last heard. I thought he was living in in a, in Yorkshire in a in a in a place with a really cold blow farm or somewhere somewhere it sounded bleak and terrible oh i don't know bleak house farm bleak, that's it. bleak house farm yeah yeah yeah, bleak yeah. House. <laughs> i wonder what became of the pink milk floats that was um uh, he's i think he's got it it was in oxford for a bit and he's got it again that's what i mean and apparently he was driving it around wales oh i don't know why wales. Wales, dolphins and sharks <laughs> so the um the book you mentioned that um, me and Steve Farragher published with you originally was um, uh, Slowly Downward. Slowly and then, Downward. And then we did um, Household Worms off the back of it. Now, Which I can see back up behind you. Indeed, yeah. A little yeah. bit of, uh, of, terror bit of well. advertising on the screen. And Produced yeah, okay. for viewers of whatever this is called. Tangent calling, it's got quite a catchy theme to me. Tangent calling, yeah. So, um, Household Worms and Slowly Downward were written roughly at the same time, I think, weren't they? But they, although they came out several years apart, is that, is that right? Or did they, or did you? Were they, More were they... or less, the Household Worms was, uh, yeah, the second one. Slowly Downward was, I think I started writing that uh, in about 1995 or six. And that was, I was having all these terrible, terrible dreams and they were keeping me, stopping me from wanting to go back to sleep because they were very, 
scary, really. And I, and I sort of found out more or less by accident that if I wrote them down, they didn't recur because they kept coming back. But if I wrote them down, it sort of seemed to sort of pin them like, like a, a moth or something to a board and he could, it, they couldn't get off. So I wrote them all down and that sort of became pretty much slowly downward was basically <clears throat> a load of dreams. Small thoughts. That's right. That's how it started. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I did it in a circular cards in a metal box. Yeah. And the way you write, you have quite a specific style. I think in my opinion, I think it's quite cinematic. Um, mm. I've been reading this book. Ah, right. I really, yes. really like. Oh, and um, yeah, I was wondering if where your uh, obviously the content has been inspired by your dreams, but the actual style because it's quite stark and yeah. You know, and for me, I, I I get a real cinema vibe, like a Stanley Kubrick vibe. Actually, I get from a lot oh, right. of it. Well, it's uh, big, I mean, because it was dreams. It's just do you know that when someone says, "Oh, I had this mad dream last night." And you just think, oh my God. And like, and they tell you, it's just like, no, 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 no. Because dreams are really boring unless they're yours. But so I thought that it's because people try to put their dream into some sort of context, you know, like they try and tell it as a story, beginning, middle, end. But dreams are just fucking middle. They're just middle. There's no beginning or end. So I thought with the, with the stories, I'll just, I won't bother with any of that. I'll just go, this happened. And then it stopped. So that that's sort of why they why they have that very sort of truncated first person sort of voice to them. Concise. Yeah. Mm. So 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 um, slowly down is actually the dreams as you did you write them down immediately you woke up or did you? Um... Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. And I, and then I'd sort of like get rid of all the stupid rubbishy bits mm. and just, but try, try and make them as short as possible. Yeah. So they were like headlines or sub headlines or something like that then household worms i think were they based on the dreams as well but 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 but, but not so much that was more um they were more based on my uh, my attempts to to earn money and uh, <laughs> have a life and sort of get on with people so they were more autobiographical really yeah yeah about, and more rooted in the real world yeah the waking world it's um do you see anything, any humour in uh, Slowly Downward? Uh, well, no, I don't myself. But I know that um, <laughs> Mr Blimfield, who published them first, he thought they were fucking hilarious. Well, I find I something know. hilarious as well. Yeah, I can see it. I've always, I've always found, found it the humour. Yeah. I, I, mean, I mean, I think they are funnier. I can sort of, now, I can sort of see why they're funny and it's more because of the sort of incongruity of the protagonist's responses to these events that seem kind of inappropriate or or yeah just that really so i can sort of see that now in, in like like uh, because it, they were written so long ago mm. it's like it's like somebody else wrote it like when i was doing that book that that you just lifted up the uh there will be no quiet. I can't. I think I just about did that in time before I forgot everything because I, I haven't got any diaries or anything. So what I had to do was go through all my old hard drives and and uh, sketchbooks and stuff and piece together roughly the order that I'd done stuff in. I sort of wanted to write that before I kind of lost my marbles, really. Mm. Something I noticed that carries through all of your work from kind of the beginning and especially in, in those dreams uh, is this kind of medieval theme I've noticed. Oh. And you said at, at the birth of the internet, you had a series of these kind of medieval torture dreams. And I was wondering why you seem to maybe link in your brain the arrival of the internet uh, with medieval England, like this kind of grim, torturous medieval England. I don't know. Uh, I guess, like the thing that goes straight to my mind is like it was like when the internet arrived, it was. I thought it was analogous to the invention of movable type. So it was the what about that sort of time. So when was that? The first Caxton's Press and 
the beginning of Fleet Street. Will Winkin the Word or something was the yeah, that's guy who brought movable type from somewhere like the Netherlands to London. And it was like at the at the close of the medieval period. And this was a in his historically that it was a, a radical time. And the church was really against it because it was about the opening up of knowledge and the sharing, knowledge becoming free. And this is exactly what happened uh, with the birth of the internet. I was really excited. I was a sort of digital evangelist thinking, you know, information wants to be free, etc. cetera. Um, not realizing that information was gonna be completely co-opted by the usual suspects really and would end up being a major threat to liberal democracy. I wondered if it was to do with, um, because you were one of the first kind of people and one of the first artists to really immerse yourself in the internet and computers in general. And so I was wondering if it made the, the rest of the world seem kind of anachronistic and outdated uh, because you were kind of immersing yourself in this new futuristic. Well, it was partly, it was partly you know, what Matt was saying about the music as well, because that, that came first. Techno and Acid House came first before the internet. It's like the internet was was everything trying to catch up with techno, because you know the I was like the idea of people playing music with guitars and drums and stuff. Why would you do that? Why would you pick up a guitar when you can make a better noise with a machine? And it's the same with why would you paint a picture when you can make a better one with a mouse, you know, and, and a screen? So I was really into all that stuff at the time. I'm not so much now. Changed my mind. At, at, the, at that that sort of early sort of mid '90s period, I think when that technology, when it started to be more accessible by the likes of us, I mean, it was such a it was such a a, a game changer in what you could what you could do, and it was, and I think the, as it as it developed, you know. From being able to, <clears throat> you know, not not like, and I love using letter set, but being able to set your own type and just and just yeah. bring it out and uh, and then when that went on, you know, to being able to shoot stuff on video and then put that into the machine and it was all moving so fast and we just kind of embraced it because it was it was new and it was so exciting and it was and it was accessible. So um, it felt really democratic as well. It felt like, you know, because, you know, if we could do it, then anyone could do it. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. like, you know, you didn't have to, you didn't have to have access to a recording studio or an edit suite or a studio. Or money, wasn't it, really? Or I money, mean, yeah, right, yeah. that was it. And you, because like, like what we were saying right at the beginning, we were like basically pretending to be students and using all the facilities that were at Plymouth Poly because that's where it was but we you know every so everything I did was was black and white to start with because that's all you could do I could only use a photocopier that's the only way I could make pictures was with a photocopier moist it was called the cartoon <laughs> was it <laughs> ah. all right yeah I just remembered there Excellent. You go. well I had totally <laughs> forgotten that I wonder if any of them still exist I'm sure somewhere in the consumer archives there's uh, there's copies of, of that stuff. Yeah, wow. If I'd been in any sort of order, you saw what I was like trying to turn this on today, I would have dragged it out, but I haven't. I'm sure that it exists. <laughs> Excellent. So um, the other book which um, I worked with you on was um, Cascoons of Terror, which of course you'd already published previously. Again, with, uh, with Mr. Blimfield. Yeah, yeah, he was, uh, um, and so, and Mr. was it, was it Mr. Crease and Weaken involved in that as well? Uh, I think that was that's, after that that we became Crease and Weaken. Augustus Crease and no, Devlin Crease right. and Augustus Weaken. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's when we we set up a rival literature festival to the literature festival. That's right. Yeah. So, Cascoons of Terror, how did that come about? It's, it's very different to um, both Household Worms and Slowly Downward, entirely different project. Yeah, well, I think uh, I got really interested in, in the idea of 
pulp writing, like the the because I think it was a time pulp was as a sort of umbrella term that's now used to describe all sorts of of books. But originally, I think it referred to the fact that these books were very cheaply made, and they were printed on paper made from wood pulp. Then that's that paper that goes yellow and absorbs water, and it's yeah, yeah. It doesn't last. <clears throat> So, and this, these were the first paperbacks, I think. Um, and they were, I think they came to this, to the UK initially after the Second World War or during it. And I think they came, they were used as ballast in ships because these books were so cheap. You could just chuck them into the bottom of a boat and they were used as ballast, which is amazing, right? And then they were sold in these um, secondhand bookstores on the Chatham Cross Road. And that's how this sort of hard-boiled noir style of writing emerged. And what happened, what I, I got really into all this because I, I sort of, I don't know, I kind of go off on these tangents. So I was reading, I, I got some books out of the library about the beginning of pulp fiction. And I found out that we, what used to happen often was that the publisher, the publishers were, you know, the, the circling sharks, the publishers, they were, they were the bosses. And so what a publisher like yourself would do, you'd have an idea, you'd be drinking cider one night, and you'd have an idea, right? Right, I know, I want to do this. And then you go to an artist, you go to an illustrator and say, can you do me a cover? I want, uh, I want sharks jumping out of the water biting people's heads off in New York, right? Do me that. And so the artist would then make this picture and then the publisher would take the picture to a writer and say, I want 60,000 words on this. You've got a month. Wow. Pay him by the word or the line. And often the writers were so poor, they didn't have their own typewriter. They had to rent a typewriter off the publisher and they didn't have their own place to work. So they'd sit in the corridor outside the publisher's office writing the stories. So I thought this was a great idea. What a brilliant way to make a book. So I said to Blimfield, right, let's, should we do this? And he, and he goes, he goes, yeah, all right. I bet you a fiver, you can't write 60,000 words in a month. And, and I said, you're on. And I, and I wrote it. So, and that's it. And it's that's did you get your fiver? I didn't get my fiver. No. <laughs> no. Oh no! It was mysteriously brassic at the crucial moment. I remember at the time you were very much enamoured with uh, Stuart Holm. Yes, yes, Stuart Holm and, was, and uh, uh, Richard uh, Allen, I think, who wrote all the skinhead books. Skinhead, but that was. That yes. was through, I, I learned about him through reading Stuart Home, because Stuart Home was writing, he wrote a book called Pure Mania about vegan terrorists, I think. Around the same, it's all around the same sort of time. Yeah, so I, I nicked a lot of character names out of Stuart Home's writing, but he, that he then, he'd taken their names from uh, the situationists I think yeah, or the right. neoists or something yeah. so names like Karen Elliott who's one of the characters in Catkins of Terror Karen Karen Elliott is I think that was a name you there was this magazine called Smile and the idea was the magazine could be any format made by anyone but whoever did it had to call themselves Karen Elliott Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't realise that yeah. was where the name came from. Oh. Yeah, there, and there, there was a few things like that. King Mob and... Yeah, that's right, yeah. Mm. Yeah, all I'm, the situation of stuff that influenced Jamie Reid and the sex There was design. something else at the time that was of relevance, and it eludes me now, but it probably, like, my still... I'm, I'm thinking it takes a while these days, but... Me too. Mm. Please <laughs> continue. Do we talk about uh, Broad Me the Movie? <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, wow, yeah. Cool. yeah. This is your, this is your, um, <clears throat> your most recent collaboration after all these years of moist and starting out with moist and the, the techno rays. Remember everything. moist <laughs> and brain machine. There has, there brain. has been intermittent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things all the way along, but uh, yeah, Broadmead 
brought me the movie. What inspired, what inspired it, Matt? Yeah. Saying? Funny enough, we were we were drinking cider in a in a pub, and um, uh, a mutual friend uh, was doing the Festival of Apathy, yeah. or they might have done at, at that point. Yeah, probably. that was impressive. And we set about to make the most boring film ever. Yeah. And, um, then it just sort of, um, I don't know, it sort of took on a life of its own. It did, yeah, because well, the, the idea of the Festival of, of Apathy, it was because there was seemed to be, at the time, there was just loads of festivals, and there was festivals of everything. There was festivals of gin, and festivals of coffee, and festivals of guitars, and, and it was just really boring, you know? So we thought we'd do a festival of apathy and uh, we'd have really boring events. Mm. And uh, if we couldn't be bothered to do anything, we'd put a note on the door saying, cancelled due to lack of interest from the organisers. Because so, no one turning up would have been, a, it would have, uh, would have been a, a great endorsement of the... Uh, exactly, yes. Yeah. So we, me and Matt, we set out to make uh, Broadmead, the movie. Um, uh, for anyone who's not familiar with, with Bristol and Broadmead, shopping centre. Broadmead was, it's a sort of compromised post-war shopping development in the centre of Bristol, which was an area heavily bombed in the Second World War. And uh, there were some grand plans to make it uh, a, a sort of welfare state, Scandinavian looking sort of shopping centre, pedestrianised for, you know, the white heat of technology, you've never had it so good sort of times. Um, but it was, it was compromised by, by the lack of money from Bristol Council and the architecture was compromised by uh, lack of money as well. So it is, it, what it is, it's a really underwhelming architecturally. Uh, and then, of course, what's happened economically, politically and so on, it's, it's made it really irrelevant. So, so what becomes relevant is, is places like Cribs Causeway or, or Cabot Circus. And um, Broadmead looks more and more like a kind of anachronistic, tatty, uh, out of time place. And, I, and it probably will be demolished quite soon. So at the same time, it's got a sort of melancholy to it, very much like our, our welfare state and uh, our health service. It's sort of decades of underinvestment and, and being overlooked by successive governments or, or administrations. It's sort of, it's, now it's, it's fucked really. Like the welfare state is fucked, like comprehensive education is fucked, you know, and everything, you know. So part, all, all of the post-war consensus is fucked. So we thought we'd make a really boring film about this place, like, 45 minutes of just static shots. So each one, you know, I think the longest static shot is nearly five minutes, which is it's almost impossible to watch. It's so boring. And you know, an exciting thing will be a pigeon taking off from a roof. And that's it. And, and the, the most exciting thing in the whole film, there's a helicopter goes across the sky. Yeah. The Basically, we spunk that in the first sort of two minutes, really. That, that's it. The high point is, is right at the beginning. It's gone. So I, 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 I understand everything you say about it being a metaphor for uh, decay and uh, a mad administration and everything, but but surely the people crossing on the escalators in Debenhams, that's, that's great. That that's was my really, favourite shot, yeah. That's really that's again, in the first yeah. couple of minutes, isn't it? Yeah, you know, that's, yeah, it. Yeah. that's it. That's it. Um, <laughs> We like them because they they reminded us of the of the that bit in Metropolis in Fritz Lang's Metropolis. Mm. You don't think that was too much of a concession to, to doing something interesting? Yeah, because you can you can see you can like, you can imagine what those people are, who what their names are, and if they have yeah. life. Yeah, yeah, but you don't see any people after that. No, you don't. no, maybe they just died. Yeah, but the probably. thing is, well, then we then we asked uh, some friends of ours, uh, John Matthias and uh, J Jay Auburn, to make to do a soundtrack for us. And uh, they just did this really, really brilliant soundtrack. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just 
and and that completely uh, it transformed yeah, the movie. Yeah. The movie then became Gestalt. something else. It was almost yeah. like an, an AMSR video to this soundtrack. Yeah. So I think, and, that, and that, you know, then we ended up showing it in the, in the White Chapel Art Gallery, which was the weirdest thing. Because this was a film we we were like basically taking bets on who's going to be the first to walk out. And then we're showing it in a posh art gallery in the East End. And NYU had it. Oh, that's right, yeah. New York University was I, shown there. But it, it kind of, um, I mean, going back to you mentioning the people, having all those shots of looking at the sky and taking out the kind of commercial element of it and sort of focusing on that, the, the sort of brutal, on brutalist, but that hard edge and all in black and white. Yeah, it did have a. Uh, it's got. Um, yeah, it's it's got a certain um, beauty to it. That's... But certainly, the music mm. really <laughs> made it into made it into something else. And yeah. like, I mean, people people that have seen it. I mean, we've we've obviously the COVID thing happened, so we aren't really had a chance to really do a lot with it. Um, no, we were going to do it live at another festival, which was also cancelled. So, mm. but people that have seen it, you know, I've, I've honestly had people stop me in Bristol and say, "Oh, you did that film? I really love that." And, da, da, da. and I was quite taken back by it. But um, yeah, what's the, what stage did you introduce the narration to the? Uh, was that was that always there, or the um, or did that come with the music, the narrative? Was it originally? Was it a silent movie? I think it was originally going to be silent. It was supposed that was part of the, how boring it was going to be. Oh, well, I, was, I was on your case oh, and said, "Will you write? Will you write something? Okay, yeah. I'll write something. Will you then narrate it?" Which I know because we narrated it at the place where I think it. I think we already had the music mm. when I did the narration. I think. Mm. Yeah, you showed it at the. Um, Next door to the Less Press Collective, didn't you? Yeah, in, uh... that, well, that's where the Festival of Apathy was yeah, based. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I couldn't be bothered to go. But... Oh, I know. Well, I, I applaud that. Yeah, yeah. Did. And there was free cider, so... Uh... Oh, yeah, right. Well, yeah. Otherwise, we wouldn't have gone either. It sounded rubbish. There's a kind of, like, uh, religious sort of vibe to the film, I think. I think the, the intro, like, the way the way the narrative works is almost it's almost like a fall from the garden of Eden sort of thing, because like you said, the first scene is the most thrilling because that music is so, it was like moving. I was like almost crying looking at Broadmead. And then from there on, and I think the mus the musicians deliberately teased that as well, because yeah. they would continually return to that motif, but not quite give you the full music. And, um, and as well, the, the shots are all on the sky as well. Yeah. So you've got this kind of spiritual thing. Why, why didn't you um, shoot any of the actual shops and people? And why did you only focus on corners of buildings and, and the sky? The, do you want, do you want the, uh, the I, <clears throat> we went out together initially and kind of were like, well, yeah, that would make a nice shot. That would make a nice shot. And, um, I was keen to not add any of the shops in it because it's a shopping centre. And in looking at the sky, it's kind of one, it's no, if you, if you're there and you look at the people going around, nobody's looking, nobody's no. looking above them. Yeah. No one's, no one's, so it was sort of like a view that you wouldn't, even if you walked through it every day, you wouldn't have necessarily seen. And, um, just the sort of the, the shapes um, and the contrast between the concrete and the and the expanse of the sky was just kind of the most interesting bit for me, really. And it's that it was at that time of year, like early in the year, and the the, the light is very is very pale. Mm. So it's that it's sort of wintry light, and all the, the trees are really spindly. There's there's nothing to sort of soften mm. any of the any of the architecture at all. And basically, I think it was because no one looks at what it what the buildings are like. 
they, they there is quite a lot of beauty in the in the design of the place but but all of the the plastic fascias of the the shop sign they're all kind of you know you can see them anywhere and this was yeah we were trying to find out like trying to kind of excavate what was there really so we were looking at it we were trying to look at it without seeing it as a shopping center so almost like we were like anthropologists or something yeah and the way you were saying broadmead seems kind of anachronistic and outdated it reminds me of what i was saying earlier about your medieval imagery because i thought there was a kind of medieval vibe to uh the whole film as well as the kind of the pious religious stuff i was talking about the music is intentionally influenced by medieval music at, at a lot of points i think yeah so is this something that you're intentionally doing or is it unconscious i think it's unconscious I, I, I don't. I can't speak for the music at all. I don't know anything about music. So I mean, we. I. I think we'd both be lying if there wasn't a certain amount of serendipity to the whole yeah. project. Um, but there were good people involved in it, and it kind of did come together. I think it's interesting, so that you brought up the religious um, element, particularly with regard to the music, because it was all recorded in the church. Yeah. They, wow. Um, it was well, record, It was recorded in one take. And um, I believe, is that right? I'm pretty sure they did it in one take and they set up in a they church. They it very quickly, yeah. Projected it and kind of played to the, uh, and played to it. And, and, uh, and I think that's... Um, yeah, because they, they had the rough... Spontaneity comes from. They had the rough cut of it, didn't they, first? Mm, yeah. And then we had to... I just, I've sort of got a vague memory of us editing it and like going, being quite specific about when a scene should shut. Mm. So, you know, it's like, how long can we, how long can we get away with yeah. before there's like, there's, an, there's a scene quite early on where we, we're basically waiting for, for a pigeon to fly off the roof. <laughs> And so we had to keep going backwards. We wanted to make it so long, the scene, as long as possible. So you kind of go, and you just get so emotionally invested in this tiny mm. pigeon mm. on a distant roof, because that's the only thing moving. Mm. And then eventually it goes and you're like, hey, that's fantastic. It's just like, you know, it's, like, and it's, it's very influenced by the films of Patrick Keeler. If you know his work, he's, He's done Robinson in Space is my favourite film by Patrick Keeler, but um, which is well worth seeking out and, and it is much better than Broadmead, but a very different thing. But um, there's a, his subsequent film, Robinson in Ruins. I went to see at the that place on the South Bank, the British Film Institute, is oh, it? Yeah, yeah. You know, big brutalist building. And so I went to see this film. It's absolutely massive. And again, nothing happens. But there's this, there's this one shot and it goes on for about four minutes and it's, and it's a, a distant hill with, with a, a tractor going up and down this distant hill re in real time. And the tractor goes up and down this hill about four times. And you kind of get so into it. Yeah. I'm just like, this is brilliant. You know, you don't need Hollywood explosions. I'll just have a tractor going up and down the hill and that's fine. So when do you think we'll be able to see Broadmead the movie? It's going to be difficult to... Uh... <laughs> That's, a no, no, That's a good point. What are we going to do? We should put it out. We've got to put it out. Where, where, would, you like, yeah. where would you most like to have it? Uh, movie. Sorry, I missed that. I missed that, love. What did you say? When we get our movie? movie. When are we... I missed it. Sorry, what was that? When are we going to... Where would you most like to screen it? Where would be your ideal... I would like to screen movie? it. Um, well, we were in discussion with the Arnold Feeney to do it, and I'd love to do a big, bigger show in Bristol. And it was, I was chatting with the um, director of programming, Phil, there, and then obviously all this COVID shit happened. So yeah. I don't know, but we will do at some stage with, and hopefully um, Stanley will do his. Uh, narration live and the chaps all play live and yeah. uh, we were going to do that at that sea change yeah. festival in dartington yeah see that was another yeah another, that was last summer would have been 
And uh, yeah, and a rough trade at Bristol was yeah. going to be. Yeah. No, you can show it in the ocean. Everything, everything. So, yeah, we should, we should get it on. As with everything, it's on hold. But, yeah. um, we should get it, try and get it on a digital platform, though, really. Definitely. Well, maybe we can show a little bit of it at the end of this. That's all right. That's a good idea. Yeah. 45 minutes of it, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really loved it. Do you think you guys will uh, collaborate on another film in the future? Because I think Broadmead was really successful. Oh, well, I don't know. don't know. We, we're all a bit, we can't actually get anywhere. Um, it would be quite, it's quite difficult to do films by Zoom. Yeah. So. Quite, pro yes, I should imagine that we'll, we'll, um, we'll certainly collaborate on other projects in future. Another film, more than likely. Yeah. Yeah. Be good. Yeah, maybe with Cinefilm. Yes. Know, or Netflix. Earlier. You might get a Netflix um, miniseries. Yeah. <laughs> we might. If Dan's attached, if Stanley's attached, we may. We may. Yeah. People are giving him under grand budgets now, you know. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that was from the municipality of Porto, I think. I met the mayor and everything. Wow. It was great, you know, it was all fab. Yeah. yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah. Wow. I went out with the, the mayor of Porto for one of the mo most, we, we ate this thing called, I can't remember what it's called, but it's the Portuguese or por, por, the speciality of Porto. Right. And uh, I think it's called a Francesina. That's it, Francesina or Francesina. And uh, we went to a, a, a restaurant that was devoted to Francesina. It's, it's evolved apparently from the working class classic cuisine. So what it is, right? If you imagine, you get uh, you get two slices or three slices of white sliced bread, and in between them, you put loads of like sliced up sausages and stuff and cheese. Right. And then you coat the whole thing in slabs of melted processed cheese, and then you pour over a sort of gravy, and it's on I'm a big lovely. plate. It's big, and uh. And everyone, everyone in Porto, the Porto people, they rave about it. Is this, they, is this like a pie that you chop up and everybody has a bit, or is it an individual? No, no it's one each. Wow. You have this thing in front of you, and it's honestly, it's like... How did you fare with that, darling? That sounds like... Well, I, I didn't know what to do, because I, <laughs> I was thinking, if I eat this, I'm going to die. <laughs> but the, the, the mayor, he's like... Oh. And the mayor, he's a young guy, he's younger than me. He's really, they're all, it's all left wing and cool over there and everything. They're all like, well, they're all eating this Francesinas and drinking lovely Vino Verde. And, and I was just, you know, sort of poking it with a fork. And <laughs> it's honestly, it's like, imagine if you're like, if you, if you totally can't cook and you're a student or something, and you've got masses of processed cheese and some white sliced bread and a load of sausage like and some gravy. That's what you'd make. That's the sort of, if you're really, really, you know, you get back from the pub, it's that sort of food or something, you know? Yeah. Food that you always think better of afterwards. <laughs> we could all try and make some for our tea tonight, the next time we meet. Yeah, look it up. It's called yeah. a Francesinia. Francesinia. Yeah. I don't know what it means. What are you doing tonight, Mr. Donwood? Have you got any plans going out, maybe? <laughs> yeah, we're going out raving. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm going to watch a film with the missus, uh, the burnt orange, something. It's oh. got uh, it's got Do not Donald Pleasance, what's his name? Do um, Donald Trump. Donald Sutherland and Mick Jagger and the chap who was um, you know the BBC redid Dracula recently. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. It's about an artist. It's about an artist who uh, an art dealer and an artist and playing people within the arts game. Oh, I can't imagine what that's like, mate, eh? Hey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I'll be doing, yeah. yeah. Danny, do you still get inspiration <clears throat> from music? When you're not working with Radiohead, do you still listen to music to produce art? <sighs> Sometimes. Uh, your mostly, record, uh, mostly for painting. I, I can't... Uh... Yeah, painting, really. Because anything that you have to think about, it's, I find it quite hard to have 
radio or, or but I put uh, records on a painting. I found uh, a brilliant way of painting is if you have uh, Frank Sinatra interspersed with Sleaford Mods. Really good, really good combination. It's I've, you'd be surprised. Did you um, fix your turntable yet? And did you listen to uh, the last thing I sent you? Not the, the not the, the ravey thing, the blue. The blue, yes, I yeah. did, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, did you make, what, what did you make of Mr. Clementine then? Oh, yes. Oh, I haven't heard it for ages. I can't remember. I'll, I'll, that's what I'll do tonight. I'll listen to that again. Uh, that, yeah, he's an interesting chap. Yeah. yeah. Benjamin Clementine. Benjamin Clementine, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Not, you've not had a go. Have a go at that. Quite, quite interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. That's good. We've covered everything in the whole world. Yeah. Most things, yeah. And we've got a recipe as well. Yeah, Francis. Yeah. And, and now, now we can listen to uh, Rick Jerram. Reading, oh, yes. Yes. Uh, got... Is it My Gyro? My gyro. Yeah, I was, so, I was so pleased to find that. Have you not got one? You must uh, have one. Uh, probably. Or I'd, Rage I'd Packet. Like, I'd, like to, I'd like to hear it again. I remember when he did... Is that the show that was at uh, Jamaica Street when he was dressed up as a tramp? Because that was brilliant. Yeah, I think it uh, was. That, yeah. No, it was, it was one you put out years ago. Um, it's about the time he did the Whiffle stuff. Ah. And it's a little little um, brown cardboard. Oh, yeah, I know, yeah. Very, yeah, very yeah, CD, album. yes. Yeah, the CD, yeah. Okay, yeah. But I've, not, I've not seen Rick or heard from Rick for a long time. He's still in oh. such a... No, me neither. Yeah, I, yeah. I, asked him, I asked him to do something. But if, do you know what? It might have even been Broadmead. I think when, when you were... No, I'm not going to do it. I think I'd asked him, and he said, "No, I'm not going to do it either." And then you ended up. <laughs> so, um, but no, I'm not seen him for uh, for some time. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll drop him a line. Yeah, yeah. sit in a park in Bath, and drink That's cider with him. Yeah. yeah. So I stop recording now. Wait. Oh, well, go on one more. Well, well, I have one last question. Sorry, oh, yeah. I just wanted to ask: How have your dreams been lately, Stanley? Oh, have they been have, have they have they been better since Trump's fucked no, off? No, I don't. I don't have them. I, they they stopped. I I cured myself of dreaming years ago. Exercised. I, I, yeah, I've actually. How did you do I've that? Been out running actually. I've just been running. Really? I don't have dreams anymore. Are you back on the running? Are you? Yeah, I went ten kilometers just now. Are you swimming as well? You mad bugger? Yeah. Are you swimming. still doing that? No, Swimming. I haven't been in for about a month. It's no, got... I think that's quite wise. The, the, the waves are too... When you sent me that text, I thought, oh, you lucky bugger, you're somewhere exotic. And then when I realised you are in Brighton, I thought, fuck yeah. that. So yeah, it's got a bit cold. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, I might have to get some gloves. No doubt. Remember we used to do that shed in Broadmead, Matt? The Christmas shed? Yes. Christmas shed. Yeah, yeah. Was that, did that influence it at all? Were the hours you spent peering out into the gloom and the drizzle and the monotony of Broadmead? Um, do you know, I actually enjoyed my time in the shed. Mm. I mean, it was always quite cold, but it was around the time of your birthday. Oh, that's yeah, right. Do you, know, do you know what? I was, I, I was always, I was always so glad of the of the money close to Christmas, mate, and uh, and uh, enjoyed uh, meeting the punters, but. Uh, yeah. Of course, you know, had, I'll, uh, talk to, I'll talk to anyone, but um, yeah. yeah. Well, we were neighbours with Mr. And Mr. Chaos, weren't we? Chaos out of <laughs> Chaos for Kay and uh, yeah, yeah. Chaos. yeah. I think we, we should put some some uh, copies of Broadmead. We've we've done a sound vinyl soundtrack of Broadmead. We should put yeah. some. Uh, oh, cool. Oh, yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well done, mate. Very Your online, <laughs> online uh, shop. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'll do that. Yeah. Beautiful uh, design on uh, 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 heavyweight heavyweight hundred eighty gram uh, vinyl. It, yeah, yeah, it's soundtrack, lovely. Actually. Soundtrack yeah. is available. It's a limit, limited, uh, limited to five hundred. I think it's got a book with lovely photographs in it and a couple of essays by reputed uh, journalists. Yeah. Uh, oh wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's very good. Tw uh, Twenty quid, I think. Twenty-five, uh, maybe. Really. Something like that. But yes, uh, we could definitely add them to the Tangent online store. I would do that, yeah, yeah. Mm. I've got well a... remembered, mate. Good lad. Yeah, yeah, yeah good yeah. show. <laughs>
I'll stop yeah. recording there and then we can say our fond farewells. Hang on. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, because now, now we've done the uh, product placement. Yes. That, that's what it's all about, really.